us who strive to know the entire Quran. They will reach the highest levels of paradise that the only level is higher than that is for the prophets and the imams. You might ask, what is the biggest significance? We human beings, one of the things that we desire, that we naturally love, naturally love to have is status. Whether it is in an important position, whether it is in a huge community, or in a small place, even amongst friends, a group of friends, three, five, ten friends, all of them are jockeying with each other that which one of them has the highest status position amongst these friends. We even see that in places like jail, the prisons. The worst place that we can, the human being can be in is a prison. Yet the prisoners, they jockey and compete with each other to see which one of them has the highest status and position in that very jail, in that very prison. This shows that this is something within our nature. We can't go without it. When this world ends and we go to the next world, it will be the same. And those people who have higher positions in this world view themselves to be somewhat better than others that don't have the same positions as they do. In this world, it doesn't make sense. But in the hereafter, in paradise, that is where position is very important. Some people reach the positions that when the inhabitants of paradise see the rewards, what they have, their status, when they look, some of the things they can see, and they wish they had those for themselves, but they did not earn it in this world. Some of the things that come along with their status other members of paradise can't even see them. But Alhamdulillah, that person who recites the Quran on a regular basis and gives it even more importance during the holy month of Ramadan than what they receive. I can't even imagine, let alone that I should stand, sit here and act like I know what I'm talking about and try to explain it to you. One verse equals to one completion. If you take one dollar to the bank and they say if you deposit your one dollar for every dollar that you deposit, we will multiply it six thousand times. Which one of us would not take this opportunity? Each one of us will be right now at the local branch lined up waiting for whatever money we have even looking in the sofas trying to find the change in there that maybe will add up to a few dollars so that we can multiply it this is money these are the things of the world i'm not saying that it's not important nowhere in islam does it say that having money and having the world is not important but everything to its own level the hereafter is permanent this world is 70 years, 80 years, 90 years, 100 at the most. How many of us know someone that has lived to be more than 100? That was one hadith about reciting the Quran. One over 6,000 times multiplied, one verse. The other hadith is also from the Prophet of Islam. Sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. In this hadith, the Prophet says that the best, someone asked him actually, someone came to the Holy Prophet and asked him that which one of the people are the best. He said that those people who begin and complete. Al Fatih wal Khatim. Who are these people? 
They asked the Prophet explain the ones that begin the recitation of the Quran and complete it. Then he said, for every completion, they have what? Da'watun mustajab. One of their supplications, their du'as will be answered. What does this mean? There are certain groups in the creation of Allah that Allah has made it wajib, obligatory upon Himself that whenever they call upon Him, He answers them. The first group, Al-Anbiya, the Prophets, when the Prophets called upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah loved them so much that He made it obligatory upon Himself to answer their dua. The other group, our A'imma, these Ma'asumin, infallibles as we call them, their da'wah is mustajab. Amongst the Ma'asumin are the Malaika, that the Malaika are those who when they call upon Allah, they ask Allah for something, Allah answered them. What does this mean? That it is the law, it is the rule of the universe, that if you reach the position of isma, that if you reach the position of infallibility, if your piety, your fear of Allah, and fearing Allah doesn't mean that we should fear Allah, the fearing of Allah as Imam Ali alayhi salam has stated, means to fear the disobedience of Allah. Allah is just. There's no need to fear someone that is just for no reason, meaning fearing the committing of the sin. This is the meaning of fearing of Allah. If one person's iman, taqwa, piety, self-control, God awareness reaches that level that they become ma'asum, and you and I can become ma'asum. Yes, we have committed sins, but if we work on it, we can reach a point in our lives where we don't commit any sin whatsoever. The law of the universe is that when a person reaches that level, whenever they call upon Allah, Allah answers them. This month of Ramadan is such, well actually before, this holy Quran is such that when we begin it and complete it, it raises us for that moment, up to the level of a ma'asum, we ask for something from Allah, Allah has promised that He will answer it. And the month of Ramadan, every ayah that we recite raises us up for that moment to a level of a ma'asum and infallible. How powerful is this month? That by reciting the verse, you reach that world of the prophets and the angels and the imams. It is the key to enter that exclusive group and to hang out for them for a while. This is the Holy Quran and how powerful it is. But how do we treat it in our lives? What do we make out of it? That's a question that each one of us has to answer for ourselves. There is another narration from Imam Ali alayhi salam which is narrated in Nahjul Balagha. When we look at the life of Imam Ali, Imam Ali was very oppressed. Very, very oppressed. When we read the pages of history and the things that they did to Ali, we can't help but to cry, even if our hearts are hardened like stones. Still, when we see what has occurred to Ali alayhi salam, it breaks the heart. His Nahjul Balagha is madloom just like himself. This book that the greatest scholars of Islam and Arabic literature, when they read this, they're in astonishment. 
Some of them have stated, like Ibn Abil Hadid, who has done an analysis and a sharh for this Nahj al Balagha, who himself is a Sunni was a Sunni scholar. He was not Shi. He has stated himself, along with others, that the words of Ali are below the words of the Creator and above the words of creation. Once he read this Nahj al Balagha, how much it astonished him and it pulled him in, that power that it has. But for us, most of us, I should say, that we may have a copy of the Nahj al Balagha, it sits on the shelves of our homes, it collects dust. Just like for 25 years, Ali alayhi salam was forced to sit in his house while others tried to perform the job that was designated for him. In this Nahj al-Balagha, Imam Ali says in one of the sermons, when coming to the Qur'an, وَعَلَيْكُمْ بِكِتَابِ اللَّهِ فَإِنَّهُ هَبْلُ الْمَتِينَ I enjoin you to the book of Allah فَإِنَّهُ هَبْلُ الْمَتِينَ هَبْل the rope matin firm it is as if Imam Ali alayhi salam is saying that in this world when we are faced with the different choices what religion should I follow what way of life should I adapt what school of thought should I make a part of my life and the world is such that every group every religion every philosophy and ideology calls us towards them the Muslims say come to us we're on the right path from the Muslims the Sunnis say come to us the Shias say come to us the Salafis say come to us the Christians say, come to us. The Protestants say, no, we are the right path. The Catholics say, no, we are the right path. The Jews say, we are the right path. The Hindus, the Buddhists, whatever you may have, every religion claims that they're on the right path and that we should come to them. There's a lot of confusion going on here. Every way of life calls us. Democracy says, no, come. This is the right way. Capitalism says no, we are the right way. Socialism says no, we are the right way. Communism says no, we are the right way. Atheism says we are the right way. All of this confusion, when we look at these, it is as if we are drowning in the sea. We're reaching up trying to find safety, grab a hold of something safe. In this life, which is a metaphor of drowning in that sea, or that drowning in the sea is a metaphor for this life. Imam turns her attention and says, That which you want to grasp, wa alaykum bi kitab Allah, fa innahu hablul mateen. When you're drowning, you want to grab something firm. If you grab something and it breaks off right away, that is the end of life. We will drown. That's it. If it holds on strongly for a few moments, gives us the false sense that we have reached salvation, then let's go. There is no benefit. It is the Quran that when we grab a hold of it tightly, it is firm enough to protect us. Even the Quran says, فَبَشِّرْ عِبَادِ الَّذِينَ يَسْتَمِعُونَ الْقَوْلِ فَيَتَّبِعُونَ أَحْسَنَا O Messenger, give the good news to those of my servants. يَسْتَمِعُونَ الْقَوْلِ Al-Qawl includes all of the different sayings. All of the religions and philosophies, ideologies, ways of life. Give the good news. فَبَشِّرْ What does that mean? Give, basically it's saying give the paradise. Give the eternal success, give the pleasure and approval of Allah to that of those of my servants who hear these. They're not closed-minded, they take it, they calculate it, 
they examine, they study that which is the best one, that which makes most sense, they accept that. فَيَتَّبِعُونَ أَحْسَنًا Imam Ali is turning our attention to this Qur'an because the Qur'an teaches us these things. But wallah, if we follow the Qur'an, Muslims should be the most open-minded on, people on the face of the earth. So much so that when other peoples see how we behave, they will automatically become attracted to Islam. يَدْخُلُونَ فِي دِينَ اللَّهِ أَفْوَاجَ When they see that. But unfortunately, it's the opposite of that. You find some of the most backward and closed-minded people in the, on the face of the earth amongst the Muslims. The factors behind that are many, but the fact remains that that is how it is. Then Imam continues, وَنُورُ mubin. This Qur'an is the clear light in this darkness of the world that we are in. We have doubts. Doubts are darkness. There's falsehood all around us. Falsehood is darkness. There are people, organizations who are constantly trying to mislead us. Misguidance is darkness. What is the light in this darkness is the Holy Quran, Imam Ali alayhi salam is telling us. Continues, nafi' That it is a beneficial cure for our illnesses. It is as if Amir al-Mu'mineen is telling us that the individual moral characteristics that are bad or negative and the immoral actions of society, both immoral individual and society, are all illnesses like a disease. Greed is a cancer. Jealousy is a heart ailment. Other moral vices or immoral actions are other types of illnesses and diseases. Imam alayhi salam is turning our attention to those, these diseases. Look at us, when we find out that something causes cancer, we are very careful. Let me give an example, maybe that years ago, to make it a little clearer. Years ago, one of the building materials that they used to use and they used to promote was asbestos. They used to make the homes, even these tiles, floor tilings, they would make it out of asbestos. Firm, strong, useful. They didn't know that this asbestos was a carcinogen, that it caused cancer. Then they found out this, this asbestos is a carcinogen, causes cancer. Nowadays, the first thing we do that when we want to move into a home, we have an inspector, a home inspector come in. One of the things that he tests is for this asbestos. If it has asbestos, we say, no, we don't want to live here. Or the seller has to make sure that he hires a professional team. They come in with their suits, the mask, well protected against this cancer causing, this disease causing agent, cleans that out, makes it ready for you and I to move in that house. Immoral characteristics are as such. Imam Ali is saying so. There are disease when it comes to things that disease our bodies, our physical health, we are very careful about it. But when it comes to those things that affect our souls, are we as careful about it? Do we examine ourselves to what level is my jealousy? To what level is my enmity? To what level does lust and anger and the things like that have control over me? How much backbiting and gossip do I do? How many times do I falsely accuse my Muslim brothers and sisters? How many lies do I spread about them? Imam alayhi salam is saying that all of these are illnesses and the cure for that, but just not any cure, a nafi, that which is really beneficial, that which has effect. You may go to the pharmacy, 
for an illness, you have a cold, you have allergies, you spend $20, $50 on some pills, you come home, you take one, it doesn't work. You take two, it doesn't work. By the time morning comes, you have taken 10 of them and they still haven't done anything. The Quran is not like that. The moment you take it and you apply it, it benefits. It starts to work to wipe out that illness and that disease, take it away from our soul, cut out that tumor from us. The Quran. Then Imam continues and mentions several other things about the Holy Quran. But for the sake of time, we won't mention all of those. One part I will mention to you and bring this discussion to a completion on the condition that you recite aloud salawat. I said aloud salawat. I don't know about you, but me, when I hear your loud salawats, it energizes me. If you don't do that, I'm going to bore you to death. I'm going to get slow, talk in a monotone style. Before you know it, you want to kick me back to Pennsylvania. But you energize me with your salawats. Salla Muhammadin wa ala Muhammad. Imam alayhi salam. He states that the Qur'an, the more you recite it, the fresher it is. The word of Allah is infinite just like Allah Himself. It never gets old, it never gets limited. The Qur'an is that there is no book on the face of the earth that you can take and read that after a while you won't get bored of it. It's old. I already know this book. You put it aside. But when it comes to the Quran, the more we go in it, into it, the more we recite it, the more we study it, we find new and fresh things, new and fresh treasures. As our Emma have described this Quran as an ocean, an endless ocean that whenever you dive into it, you pull out a new gem, a new pearl, or whatever treasures that it offers. Why? First and foremost, because the Quran leans on Allah, and Allah is infinite. He never gets old and tiring. His words never get old and tiring. Secondly, Allah has, someone came and asked Imam Sadiq for the reason for that. He said because Allah has made the Quran for all times and all peoples. It's not specific to a certain time or to a specific people. It is for every people, for every time until the day of judgment. This Qur'an gives us something new every time we read it. The more we read it, the more we want to read it. The more we learn from it, the more we want. It makes us thirsty for more. Every era, we see that the Qur'an offers something new. I'll give you an example. In today's age, years ago, especially during the time of the Qur'an, People didn't even believe that the earth was round. They used to believe that scientific view that was prevalent on the face of the earth was that the earth is flat and that it is the center of the universe or the center of our solar system. Then the Quran came and it mentions certain things about the universe, this world that we live in. Nowadays, just recently, with the advancements in the fields of astronomy and physics, most scientists, or a large portion of them, and among them many people from the general public, are in the belief or have the belief that life exists outside of this planet. Logically, we, if we say the opposite, 
it doesn't make sense. It's illogical. This universe of ours, that, this galaxy of ours that has over 100 billion stars, around each of these stars there's a solar system with, with planets. Are we to say that out of these only our solar system has life? Only our planet has life. This galaxy in billions and trillions and numbers that I don't even know, zeros that I can't even count, exist in this universe. Are we to say that there is no life? So as our knowledge and understanding progress, we are mostly in the belief that life exists outside of this world. But when we look at the Quran, we claim that the Quran is for all times until the day, end of judgment. What does it have for this age of science and technology and space travel? We turn to the 42nd surah of the Quran. Count down, go to verse number 29. What does the Quran say? وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ خَلْقُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ that from the signs of Allah is the creation of the heavens and the earth. And we said that this universe is the part of the first sama. There are six more samawat on top of it. وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ خَلْقُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ And that in this Samawat and ours, the creation of that, Wabatha Fihima Mindaba. Pay close attention to the words of Allah. Wabatha Fihima Mindaba. That Daba, living beings, animals, human beings, a living creature. Al Daba is referring to that. But that they are living. Allah is saying that He uses the word fi hima. Hima is the pronoun for both the samawat and ard. The Quran here is clearly stating that life is living on the earth and in the heavens. All of these planets that exist in our galaxy and other galaxies. There are living creatures in them, like us and different from us, that they live. What's even more amazing is that when we look further into this verse of the Quran, وَهُوَ عَلَى جَمْئِهِمْ إِذَا يَشَاءَ قَدِيرٌ That Allah is such that whenever He wants to bring them together, whenever He wants to, إِذَا يَشَاء Qadir, He has the power to do that. What is the Qur'an telling us? 1400, over 1400 years ago, a Rasul who was Ummi, never went and sat in a classroom, never had a teacher, other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, didn't read, didn't write, from that environment of the, of the Arabian Peninsula, I don't like to call it Saudi Arabia, of Hejaz, of Arabia. From that environment of backwardness, of ignorance, the amount of people that knew how to read or write, you could count with your fingers of one hand or using both hands. They didn't exceed that. He came to this world at that time and the words that he spoke we're only beginning to understand now today that the Quran says there is life on the earth and in the heavens these planets and galaxies around us not only is there life but one day they will start traveling there will be space travel and they will come together وَهُوَ عَلَىٰ جَمْعِهِمْ إِذَا يَشَاءَ قَدِيرٌ That means the Qur'an is saying that soon there will be space travel. People from other worlds, other planets will come to Earth. Us Earthlings, we will go and visit other planets and then we will have meetings with them. We will see them. We will learn new things. But out of all of that, 
How blessed we are to be the followers of the school of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam That our prophet and our imams are their prophets and their imams as well. Not saying that Allah didn't send any guides for them other than our 14 ma'asumin, but no one reaches their level. From all of these people and all of these creatures in this universe, Allah has bestowed that gift upon us, the Quran is telling us. That He has made us the followers of Ahlul Bayt. How do we value it and appreciate it? I don't know. But when they do come and visit here, where do you think is going to be the first places that they want to visit? Washington DC, the Toronto Tower or whatever they call it, the London Bridge, the Pyramids of Egypt. No, they're going to want to go to the Karbala of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. They were going to want to do the ziyarat of Abba Abdullah al-Hussein alayhi salam. Yet we have this opportunity now. We don't need spaceships and space travel to go see Imam Hussein. Do we? That's a question that we all have to answer for ourselves. Salla ala Muhammad.